Welcome back to Piers Morgan Uncensored. Kim Jong-un and Vladimir Putin met at a Russian spaceport today to talk about potential weapons and satellite technology deals. The world's most deadly and shortest dictators took the rocket launch site before sitting down for a press conference where they talked about prioritising the strategic importance of North Korea-Russia relations, which should send a, send a shudder down all our spines. Is this new worrying development in the real Star Wars or are Kim and Vlad just trivial bit part players in a new global space race? Well, who better to ask than the world's, well, he's the most brilliant and the world's most famous astrophysicist, Neil deGrasse Tyson. So pleased to have him back on the show. Neil, great to see you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks for having me back. So Kim Jong-un, Vladimir Putin and space seems an unholy trilogy. What is your view <laughs> of what, what, what went down today? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I wasn't in the conversation, but seeing the images, uh, it's it's a little bit worrisome because space is is we've known for decades, though it's a it's a new high ground, and from a military strategic perspective, high ground gives you power, mm -hmm. uh, power that you didn't previously have. So yes, this this alliance of of nations that, that we're not friendly with. Uh, now that we're not friendly with concerns me. But what concerns me even more is space can be a place where we all come together mm. for peaceful purposes, more so than anything we might ever do on Earth's surface. So uh, for me, it's an extra offense for anyone to speak of space weaponry. Uh, because in space, while yeah, you can have borders of countries on Earth, in space, there are no borders, right? right? It's just space. And so, it, to me, it's a violation of a, of, of a human... Our, the, our, our species contract with the universe, if I can call it yeah, that. Yeah, no, I, when you saw, for example, India launching rockets um, last week, I think it was, I mean, it, I found that very uplifting to watch that. It was amazing to watch it, exciting. I remember it took me right back to the 60s and 70s when I used to watch all the rocket launches as a kid. Uh, what did you feel? watching all that. Yeah, so uh, you're, you're probably talking about the mission that where they landed near the South Pole of the Moon, as the yeah. graphic there uh, shows. So they're the first country to land in that part of the Moon. The South Pole might have a repository of water trapped in the base of craters where the sun don't shine, mm. <laughs> because the rim of the crater is higher than the angle that the sun will ever reach it. And so the history of comet impacts and other things, water brought to the Moon would evaporate where the sun shines, but stay forever where the sun doesn't shine. And so they're the first there. This was great. They were dancing in the streets. Yes. And uh, I was, uh, so, and they become the fourth country to softly land on the moon, mm. adjoining. The, and so the idea that this becomes an, a, a world uh, where countries participate uh, so that it becomes, the solar system becomes our collective backyard. A am I am I too naive to think that that's possible? I, I don't know. Well, but it's interesting. Be, it's it's, uh, it's a bit like it. artificial intelligence. You know, a lot of it is incredibly exciting and, you know, wildly, like, you know, you can go into wild new frontiers of, of potential. And, of course, there's another part of me thinks this is going to be incredibly dangerous because the wrong people will get their hands on AI and do bad things with it. Yeah, so that's a very important observation to make because the press that AI is getting today leaves people to think that all AI is bad mm. when, in my field, we've been using AI for decades at some levels or another, and every next power of AI that comes on, on online, we absorb it because we let it do the work. I don't want it to do the work. Right. <laughs> I have right. other things I can do. Yeah, so, so yeah, it shouldn't indict the entire enterprise of AI because you can imagine some parts of AI turning rogue. So with space, yeah, I, I, I want space to be peaceful. Think about it. In the International Space Station, it is a joint project with Russia and the United States and other countries. So if countries can't get along on Earth, do you expect astronauts in space to say, okay, separate, don't talk to each other because our leaders can't get along? That's almost childish mm. to expect that. When, when you have scientists and engineers in space doing real interesting work for the there benefit two, of our two species. There are two stories, Neil, that I, when I saw them, I thought of you immediately. One is that scientists at NASA have announced the existence of a possible planet that could sustain life. Tell me about this. 
Yeah, so that's uh, the James Webb Space Telescope, if it's the new story I'm thinking about. Uh, uh, it has the power to observe the atmosphere and the chemical composition of the atmosphere of exoplanets if the planet passes in front of the host star. Light from the host star will move through the air and the chemicals in the atmosphere will leave its fingerprint in the spectrum that we receive. And it found methane, it found carbon dioxide, and th these consider these as biomarkers. If there's evidence of life on the surface, it may, if there's life on the surface, it may manifest in the chemistry of the atmosphere. And it's in the Goldilocks zone where you can sustain liquid water. Too close, the water evaporates. Too far, the water freezes. Everywhere there's liquid water on Earth, there's life. If not fishes, then there's microbial life. So NASA's mantra is follow the water if you want to find life. And if we, so if this, so if I'm ready for the, the, the list of planets to go to, uh, we'll rank them based on these kinds of evidence right. to say, if, if we want to uh, have a second Earth or move somewhere, let's try this one first, and then the next one, and then the next one. Because mm. plenty of the exoplanets would be fully in, inhospitable to life as we know it. Fascinating. Uh, the other thing was UFOs. So the US Congress convened uh, this panel about unidentified anomalous phenomenon, UAPs, to try and work out what we do and don't know. Um, at the same time, as we're speaking, this is freaky, but as we're speaking, apparently the Mexican parliament Someone's just produced images of alien corpses uh, in the Mexican parliament and said they're alien corpses. So I guess my question for you, Neil, is do you believe that there are loads of aliens out there? Do you believe that governments perhaps know more than we do? Um, and should we be fearful about this? Yeah, so first of all, those are not images of alien corpses in Mexico. Those are presented as actual alien mummif mummified aliens from like a thousand years ago. So here's what you do. When we went to the moon, we brought moon rocks back and NASA allowed scientists of the world to analyze those rocks. It shared samples with everyone rather than give it to only one lab. So if those are actual mummified aliens, mm found in Mexico or wherever they were, I overheard the press conference, they said they carbon-14 dated it. It has 30% overlap DNA with humans. If those are aliens, that would be amazing. Mm. But in science, you need verification from independent sources. So what they should do, as we know from, al from, from mummies, uh, there's still a, a soft tissue in the mummies. If you carbon-14 dated that, I don't know if he did it on the soft tissue or on the bones, but my, my point is, you share the data with other laboratories. Mm. And when you have agreement among what is measured, then you can talk about it as a discovery. But the press loves chasing singular stories mm. by one laboratory that says, no one else has this, but we do. Mm. You all just run to that and report it like it's the truth. So, but science is not established by single measurements or observations. Are you, you have saying, to verify are you it. Are, it is, we, are you saying we tend to sensationalize these things now? <laughs> <laughs> no, did I say that? <laughs> yes, you did. Yes, you did. Uh, let's take a short break. I want to come back and talk about your brilliant new book, To Infinity and Beyond, and about vegans and about God. Maybe not even in that order. Welcome back to Piers Morgan Uncensored. I'm talking to arguably the most popular scientist in the universe ever, Professor Neil deGrasse Tyson, whose new book, just to do a bit of media sensationalism there, Neil, his new book, uh, To Infinity and Beyond, is out this month. It's, it's absolutely riveting. You write about this stuff so brilliantly. You bring it all so alive. Um, I want to go into a few things. But first of all, the key question for me with all this, especially when I was reading your book, how much do you think we know and how much do you think we don't know about what's out there? That's a great question. And... Uh, I can actually quantify that answer. So there, there are these things, there's dark matter you might have heard about. So dark matter is 85%, it's responsible for 85% of the gravity in the universe. And we have no idea what it is, but we can measure it. There's dark energy responsible for the accelerated expansion of the universe. We can measure that, but we don't know what's causing it. And then you add up all of these sort of, what these forces are doing, in the universe, it's 96% of what's driving the universe. 
And all the forces of nature that we know and love, gravity, uh, electromagnetism, the strong and weak nuclear forces, life, chemistry, biology, physics, that's in 4% of the universe. So we know enough about the universe to quantify our ignorance. So we know 4% of what's going on out there. But also keep in mind that as the area of our knowledge grows, so too does the perimeter of our ignorance. And that is the very soul of science, that there are questions, people say, what questions do you want answered? Yeah, I don't think that way. I think, what question do I not even yet know yes, to ask? I think that's the really because interesting part, is that you're probably not even the thinking of, of the all. great question, right? Because there may be something Correct. so... Correct, I, I, I lose sleep over that, yes. Now, how, you're, I know you're an avowed atheist. How can you be so certain that there is no supernatural, godlike entity out there, given that we know so little? Well, first, I, I don't count myself among the ranks of avowed atheists. And I, I'll, tell, I'll give a fast <laughs> example why. A friend of mine went up to fix the Hubble telescope, okay, on the space shuttle. And on my, on my, on my Facebook feed, I said, uh, Godspeed to the space shuttle astronauts. And then in the comment thread, it said, I thought you were an atheist. How could you possibly say that? And so the fact that I gleefully said that and atheists complained about it, clearly I'm not an atheist. Okay? What are you? My favorite, uh, my favorite Broadway musical of all time is Jesus Christ Superstar, which I saw in <laughs> real time in New York City. And I don't know that atheists can... So, I don't, so is there you know, a God I then, Neil keep... deGrasse Tyson? I'll be about to have breaking I, I news. I don't know. Is there a God? Okay, so I will tell you is that with, there are a lot of unknowns in the universe, but just because there are unknowns does not mean there's a deity in the unknown. If you're going to assign doesn't a mean deity there isn't. to that which... It doesn't mean there isn't, that's correct. So you're more but of an I open mind that, about this, right? I, everyone should. If the, the unknown is the unknown. But the, 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 the track record of... People saying, God is behind this, and then you add a little science to it, and you find out, no, we can completely explain it and control it. Then that the history of that exercise is so rich with science discovering the unknowns that were previously ascribed to deity, like lightning bolts and weather systems. Mm. There was Poseidon. There was Zeus. There was, just look at the history of mm. this. I'm, I'm not given reason to say, we're going to find something. God is going to be at the center of that, and there'll be no science to apply. I'm going to look for the science first, because that's how the history of this exercise has unfolded. Now, I want to play you a clip. This is you talking to Joe Rogan about vegans. You want to save animals? Um, I, I never seen I've never seen anyone say save the leeches. No, or, no or one cares about bugs. Save the ticks. And you can ask if you're really into animals and don't want to kill them. If you heard that ticks were endangered, would you start a movement to protect ticks? W would you do that? And if you would, uh, more power to you. But I'm thinking you're not. They're not. It's the little guys they don't care about. I've had this debate <laughs> with vegans. I had one last week. I have it every month. And I always point out, most vegans I know munch away on almonds and avocados and they turn a blind eye to the fact that this causes the mass murder of billions of bees, mainly in California. They don't want to have that debate because <laughs> they don't care about the little guys, Neil. <laughs> my, my, my only reaction there is... Um, that comment was addressing only vegans who are vegans because they don't want to kill animals. Yes, no, there I agree. Other reasons to be vegan. Of course. Right, for the health or the environment. No, no, I'm talking but specifically those who didn't want to kill... The ones who run into steakhouses playing sounds of cows being slaughtered, they're the ones that munch avocados and almonds, invariably. Yeah, and by the way, and they are dining upon the reproductive organs of plants. That's yes. kind of weird. And I imagine if, if, an, if, a, if a plant-based alien visited Earth, they would freak out when they saw vegetarians yes. <laughs> because the vegetarians would be eating them, right? And 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 vegetarians target um, not only the reproductive organs, the nuts, the berries, the flowers, but they also target the infant versions of it. With baby lettuce, baby carrots, baby... Oh, my this is, God! This would terrify a plant-based alien. So that's just a cosmic perspective on that No, diet. no, you've I, given me... All. You have I, given I, me a whole new line of attack. 
The, the, the flower babies. I love it. This is fantastic. Uh, I, I, I just, they, I find the... That's, wait, that's dangerous. If, if It's dangerous to feed you more lines of attack because I don't know what you're going to do with it. No, but I always like to take these things to their... debates to their logical end, right? I mean, and it seems to me they... when it suits them... They care about the bigger animals, the cuddly ones, but when it comes to the little guys, the, they're not interested. Um, now, I want to talk yeah, about the furry, something... the furry ones so, especially. Something even more mm -hmm. iconic, actually, than God or vegans, and it's your moustache, which has become one of the world's most famous moustaches. And here's extraordinary. There's a whole website that's been set up called DeGrasse Tyson's Moustache. And <laughs> we did a bit of research ourselves, a bit of scientific research, <laughs> Uh, and there's a, a, a moustache montage that we have here, which is quite extraordinary. It, it turns out almost every brilliant scientist has had a magnificent tash. Uh, Nikola Tesla, the inventor extraordinaire, oh. great tash. Louis de Broglie, the discovered the wave-like nature of all matter, great tash. Hans Geiger, famous for the Geiger counter. Robert H. Goddard built the first liquid-fueled uh, rocket. And, of course, Albert Einstein, probably the one nearest to your own. Um, you, I mean, you've become the modern-day godfather of science moustaches, but very much <laughs> running in a sort of a, a great, long, historic list of great tashes. I, 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 I never thought about it. Th this moustache, I've never shaved it in my life. Yes, I've trimmed it, but it's ever since I could grow a mustache, I've had a mustache. So uh, <laughs> it's just part of my life. And even it was kind of out of style a few years ago. And I, so I was a little bit... I did get rid of my mutton chop sideburns. <laughs> I figured, okay, that's from 1978. I could lose those. But I, I did keep the mustache. But if I were to vote among those mustaches, yes. I would say, you know, we remember Einstein as this wire-haired, yes. you know, gray, big, bushy eyebrows. But... He, he was a dashing young man. He you was. see him in a tuxedo. Uh, yes, look at that mustache. That's like a Magnum PI mustache right there. If you could, final so, question, Neil. If you could have dinner tonight with any scientist in the history of recording mankind, who would it be? Yeah, it would be, oh, no question about it, Isaac Newton. But I think about that all the time, and I'd say, Isaac, come for dinner. And he'd look out the window, and he'd see these things moving. He said, what are those? And I'd say, well, they're horse-drawn carriages without a horse. He said, well, how do they move? Well, they use gasoline. What's gasoline? Oh, it's fossil fuels. What's fossil fuels? And after five minutes of this, i say, go back to where you came from. <laughs> also, unfortunately, your because answer... there's so much that has happened since then. Well, your answer is completely... I don't killed... know if I have the patience. Well, you killed my theory also, because Isaac Newton famously was clean shaved. Oh, <laughs> well, um, Newton, we, we see him with these big locks of curls, but I think that was actually a wig on top of much shorter hair. Huh? And the statue of him in Cambridge, at the, in the, a tr Trinity in, a church in Cambridge, mm. um, it's, he, you, shoot, you see him with short hair. Wow. So I was so disappointed when I heard of that, yeah. <laughs> Neil, I could honestly interview you every single day and it would never get boring. You've got a fantastic way of bringing this stuff to life. To infinity and beyond, a journey of cosmic discovery. Neil deGrasse Tyson and Lindsay Walker. It's a number one New York Times bestseller, as all your books are. It's a fantastic reading. Great to have you back on Uncensored. Thank you. Thank you. Mm-hmm.